Okay, I want to talk about Coral Castle. This is a very interesting place that um, fortunately I was able to visit several years ago. Now, Coral Castle is a stone structure that was created by a Latvian American named Edward Lead Skalnen. And uh, he lived from 1887 to 1951. And uh, currently it's off of Highway 1 uh, in the Miami-Dade County of Florida. Now the structure comprises uh, numerous megalithic stones, mostly limestone formed from coral, each weighing several tons. And it's currently a privately operated tourist attraction. But the, the strangest thing of all is no one understands or knows how Edward Lee Scalman built this place. He was only about five foot uh, tall and about 100 pounds, and he suffered from tuberculosis. Now, the story goes that um, Edward was born on January 12, 1887 in um, Latvia. And not much is known about his childhood other than he was not wealthy and he only achieved a fourth grade education. He was a sickly boy and he spent a lot of his time reading books and he dropped out of school because it bored him. Now allegedly at the age of 26 he was engaged to marry Agnes Scuffs, a girl that was 10 years younger than him. However, the girl that Lead Scallion referred to as his sweet 16 broke the engagement the night before their wedding, and thus he immigrated to North America, where he found work in various lumber camps in Canada, California, and Texas. But he contracted tuberculosis, unfortunately. So he moved to the warmer climate of Florida in 1919, where he purchased a small piece of land in Florida City. And over the next 20 years, Lead Scallion worked on his massive coral monuments, which he called Rockgate Park, and he dedicated it to the girl that had left him years before. He would work alone at night, and eventually he ended up quarrying and sculpting over 1,100 short tons of coral into a monument that would be later known as Coral Castle. He used basic tools, several made from timber and parts of an old Ford, and he built a house out of coral and timber. Then he gradually built the monuments for which he is famous. Now, in, in spite of his private nature, he eventually opened up his monument to the public, offering tours for 10 cents each. And he was a surprisingly accommodating host, and he would even cook hot dogs for the children when they came to visit. But when asked when um, he was able to move all the stone by himself, he refused to give any information on his method. The only thing that he would say is, I understand the laws of weight and leverage, and I know the secrets of the people who built the pyramids, being those at the site of Giza in Egypt. Now, he originally had constructed this uh, monument uh, in Florida City in the 1920s. But he knew that wasn't a very popular area, so he rented a truck in the mid-1930s and a driver, and he moved everything to its present location on a 10-acre site near Homestead, Florida. On November 9, 1951, he checked himself into Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, and he, he suffered a stroke at one point, uh, either before he left for the hospital or at the hospital. He died 28 liters of uh, a kidney infection at the age of 64. And uh, his death certificate noted that his death was a result of uremia, or failure of the kidneys, due to infections and abscesses. But he um, lives on in what he did. Now, to this day, no one understands how Ed was able to do all of this himself 
you know, at five feet tall, 100 pounds with tuberculosis, not only building it once, but lifting all of the rocks up, the stones, and moving it and putting them back down again. And there's been a lot of conjecture that um, maybe his past was a little bit more uh, um, to it. I've seen some things written that he was a guard for the, the Tsar of Russia and may have fled after he was killed. I don't know if th that has been substantiated or not. Um, a lot of people conjecture on how he was able to do it. They feel he used some kind of electromagnetic uh, system and uh, audio waves. Other people think it was just plain old mechanical engineering. He did have a tripod and, a pul and pulleys and a generator on site. Um, today it's very rusted, but all of his equipment, most of it's still there. Now what's interesting to me is that he wrote... Um, three small books, and one of them was called Magne uh, Magnetic Current, and the other one was called A Book in Every Home, and the last one was just Mineral, Vegetable, and Animal Life. Now, The Book in Every Home was just talking about morals and how to behave and be a, a good person in life. The Magnetic Current book is rather interesting. And I'm going to read a little bit of it to you, just to let you think about something he said. I'm going to read a little bit in the beginning where he talks about his experiments with magnets. And then I'm going to skip to the end where he talks about the earth. Okay, so he says, um, following the result of my two years experiment with magnets at Rockgate, 17 miles southwest from Miami, Florida, between 25th and 26th latitude and 80th and 80, 81st longitude west. First, I will describe what a magnet is. You have seen straight bar man, magnets, U-shaped magnets, spare or ball magnets, and Alnico magnets in many shapes, and usually a hole in the middle. In all magnets, one end of the metal is, a, is North Pole and the other South Pole. In those which have no end, one side is North Pole and the other South Pole. Now, about the sphere magnet. If you have a strong magnet, you can change the poles in that sphere in any side you want or take the poles out so the sphere will, know, will not be a magnet anymore. From this you can see that the magnet can be shifted and concentrated, and also you can see that the metal is not the real magnet. The real magnet is the substance that is circulating in the metal. Each particle in the substance is an individual magnet by itself, and both North and South Pole individual magnets, they are so small that they can pass through everything. In fact, they can pass through metal easier than through air, through the air. They are in a constant motion. They are running one kind of magnet against the other kind. And if guided in the right channels, they possess perpetual power. The North and South Pole magnets are cosmic force. They hold together the Earth and everything in it. Each North and South Pole magnet is equal in strength. <coughs> but the strength of each individual magnet doesn't amount to anything. To be a practical use, they will have to be in great numbers. Okay. Now, I just let me skip down to what he says about the Earth. The Earth itself is a great big magnet. In general, these North and South Pole individual magnets are circulating in the same way as in the permanent uh, magnet metal. The North Pole individual magnets are coming out of the Earth's South Pole and are running around in the Earth's North Pole and back to its own pole. And South Pole individual magnets are coming out of the Earth's North Pole and are running around and in Earth's and, and back to its own end. Then both North and South Pole individual magnets start to run over and over again. In a permanent magnet bar, between the poles, 
there is a semi-neutral part where there is not much going in or out. But on the Earth, there is no place where the magnets are not going in or out. But, but the magnets are running in and out of the pole ends more than at the equator. Now, you can get equipment, and I will tell you, so you can see it for yourself, that is in the way I have told. Get a permanent magnet bar four inches long, a U-shaped magnet that is strong enough to lift from 10 to 20 pounds, an Alnico magnet about three inches long, two and one half inches wide, one inch thick, hole in the middle and poles in each end, several feet in length of hard steel fi uh, fishing line, Line when it is not in coil, it stays straight, and a soft steel welding rod one eighth of an inch thick and three feet long. From the fishing wire and the welding rod, you will make magnets or compasses, and if you hang them up in fine threads by middle and keep them there, they will be permanent magnets. Okay, so he goes on and he describes some. Um, experiments with magnets and um, he continues to discuss, to discuss the earth and uh, break it down into magnetics um, he talks about generators and so on but um, I have to wonder, you know, just because of the trip that I, you know, I went out there and I kind of researched a little bit online, you know, what this guy knew. And he had, like I said, he had pulleys. And um, you could argue that he was a very good mechanical engineer and knew how to leverage those rocks and move them, you know, with the pulley system. Or... Perhaps he knew some kind of a, a way to magnetize um, the rock or put some kind of a, I don't know, something around it, some metal uh, wiring or whatever to make it magnetic and then switch the poles and then uh, perhaps, you know, it could move to match the poles of the earth and that's how he flipped things. I don't really know, but for a guy that only had a fourth grade fourth grade education, he was only five foot tall and a hundred pounds. It is certainly amazing what he did, and um, I put some pictures out there. I only took some film. Um, I wish I would have done more, but I'll I'll try and put some of them the film that I took when I was out there, but um, <clears throat> this is a mystery that's going to go on for a while, and uh, nobody has figured it out, but it's a very interesting story, and um, I kind of have a feeling he did a combination of uh, mechanical engineering and some, something with this uh, magnetic theories of his and his experimenting with magnets and flipping poles. So hopefully maybe someone could figure that out. Now, in some of my other work, I pointed out that um, Theodorus Siculus described the method of moving large rocks to build the pyramids, and it was uh, through hills. And they would build hills and then run the, the rock down and as, the, as the hills decreased get it to where they wanted, and then um, the hills went away. But you still have to lift it, which I would imagine a lot of manpower could do it. I've seen pictures of indigenous people moving very large rocks, and um, it's pretty much manual labor. But that's a lot of manpower. So how this Ed Lee Scal... Uh, Lead Scallman did it. I don't really know, but I suspect that um, it was a combination between mechanical engineering 
and uh, what he knew about uh, magnets and flipping poles on the magnet and um, using the Earth's magnetic uh, poles possibly to help. But very interesting story. So that's just my little talk on uh, Coral Castle. It was a real fun place to visit. If you ever get a ch chance to go out there during the day and take a look around, it's worth doing. Okay, thank you very much. Did you know that by the sidewalk on your way out to the castle, my old admission date is there. It was last before the city. There's yeah. all the lizards. Oh yeah, on the walls. I don't say. Ten by every five more minutes to go. No, it doesn't matter. Not on this side. You can draw there. Okay.